Thank you everyone for coming tonight. I'd like to welcome you all to the Urban Neighborhood Alliances Forum for the candidates for DC Council at Large in the April 3rd Democratic primary. My name is David Alpert and I am the founder and editor-in-chief of Greater Greater Washington, a website about urban planning and transportation in the Washington metropolitan area. I want to thank our candidates, at least Peter Shapiro and Gail Anderson Holness, for joining us tonight. Uh, the others, Sekou Biddle and Vincent Orange, uh, should be here any minute. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Black Cat for generously hosting us today. The Black Cat has uh, ar arranged, yes, thank you, please give them a round of applause. The Black Cat has arranged for us to have some occasional background music in the form of sound checks for another, uh, another music event that will be taking place upstairs. So if you hear some, uh, some nice background music, it's not uh, any kind of statement about what the candidates have just said necessarily, at least not as far as we know. Uh, first, I'm going to give each of our candidates who is here one minute for a statement introducing himself or herself. Uh, in the interest of covering all the topics we want to cover, Jack Jacobson, right in the front, who organized this forum, will be keeping time, and he's going to be a strict enforcer. He's going to raise a hand when you have 10 seconds remaining, and then he will start counting down from five when you have uh, fewer than five seconds remaining. And he will shout out time when you run out of time, and I would ask you all to please, uh, please conclude your statements at that time. All right, so we drew for random order, and uh, Peter Shapiro was first uh, in the order of the uh, candidates who are here so far, so I'd like to uh, ask uh, Mr. Shapiro to give an introduction. Can I take the mic with me? I don't know. <laughs> I swear you're out there, I really know you are. <laughs> I'm Peter Shapiro. I'm a candidate for D.C. City Council at large, running in the Democratic primary. April 3rd is the Democratic primary. And I'm running because we have a very broken political system right now. We have some of our highest elected officials that are under federal investigation. And actually, another shoe has just dropped uh, with the person who I'm running against, the incumbent in the seat, where the feds are now looking into Vincent Orange's uh, campaign finance records as well. The news is just getting worse and worse and worse. The problem with this is, the reason why this is such an issue, besides the fact that it's an embarrassment, uh, it's painful to be in this city and watch this happen, the other problem with it is that we have a council that isn't doing the job that we want them to do. They're, because of all the scandals, because of the ethical crises, because of the infighting, they're not getting to the work of helping to improve the city. So not enough emphasis on the school reforms that we need, not enough emphasis on the neighborhood revitalization, not enough emphasis, first and foremost, on the job creation Time. that will help lead this city out of poverty, the neighborhoods out of poverty. Time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Shapiro. Dr. Holness. Thank you. I'm E. Gail Anderson Holness. I'm an ANC commissioner in Ward 1. I've lived in Ward 1 for oh, almost 35 years. I was um, 1B11 ANC and former chair of 1B. I want to be your voice. I want to be your voice for employment for DC residents. I want to be your voice for affordable housing, not just for low income residents of Washington DC, but for all residents in Washington DC. I want to be your voice for parking in the District of Columbia. I want to be your voice for education reform, yes, but I want to be your voice for making sure that we have enough bike lanes so that when not only I ride my bike or you ride your bicycle in the District of Columbia, we are in a safe environment. I'm a graduate of Howard Law School. I'm the only candidate of the four Democratic candidates who has not received any campaign contributions. I'm unbought, I'm unbossed, I will not pay to play, and I'm here to represent you. I'm skilled leader, leader and I want to represent and be the fresh new face that the District of Columbia needs on the City Council. Thank you very much, Dr. Holness. Um, and now uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Vincent Orange. Uh, each person is uh, speaking for 30 seconds to introduce himself or herself. 60, I'm sorry, yes, 60. <laughs> Later, it will be 30. Well, first of all, let me begin by saying good evening to everyone. And my name is Vincent Orange. I'm the at-large council member. I also serve as the Democratic National, uh, National Committee man. I'm number one on the ballot, and I would love to have your vote on April 3rd. I am running basically on the four E's. That is ethics, 
education, employment, and economic development. I have a very strong record in each one of those categories. Uh, here lately, uh, when this legislation passed, I was able to get a removal process for council members who engage in an unethical behavior, as well as an ethics certification by each council member on an annual basis that will highlight activity that takes place during the year. In terms of education, I spearheaded the reopening of McKinley Tech as a technology high school. I've got legislation passed for our children to get books by the second uh, week of school. I don't know what does that mean, five seconds? That ten means seconds? ten. Ten uh, seconds. Yeah, well, I will uh, finish uh, a little later, but Vincent Orange, number one on the ballot. I'm running on the four E's, ethics, education, employment, and economic development. Thank you very much, Councilmember Orange. Uh, Sekou Biddle is also on his way, uh, but uh, has uh, had another event, and so he will start joining in our question and answer discussion as soon as he arrives. We'll move on to some questions. For the first segment, I'm going to ask a question of a specific candidate uh, for each of the candidates. That candidate will have one minute to respond. Then we, each other candidate will have 30 seconds to give their answers as well. I may ask a follow-up question if uh, something an individual candidate says uh, raises another issue, or if I think that a candidate has not been responding to, uh, to the question that I asked. Also, if members of the audience who are watching here or people who are watching on the video stream uh, at home have any suggestions for follow-up questions, you can tweet them with the hashtag decision12, that's D-C-I-S-I-O-N 12, uh, and I will try to monitor the tweets uh, from time to time here on my phone and ask some follow-ups if uh, I think there's a good follow-up on there as well. So our first question is going to go to Dr. Holness. Dr. Holness, this forum was organized by the Urban Neighborhood Alliance, which promotes livable and prosperous neighborhoods in the denser areas of the district. To start, could you please tell us what you admire about DC's urban neighborhoods and what you think they contribute to a vital district of Columbia? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I live in this neighborhood. I love urban America. I love the uh, ability to get on the subway or ride my bike and have uh, adequate bike lanes. I like being able to go to neighborhood events and, and not having to drive long distance. I like living in a neighborhood where there's camaraderie, where people care about each other, where there's good artscape in the neighborhood, where there are things to do. I'm, uh, there's a, in our neighborhood, particularly in Ward 1, there, everything we need is here. We have uh, institutions of higher learning. We have some of the best p uh, public schools in the district in, in Ward 1. This is just a wonderful place to live, and I love the fact that it is affordable and we don't have to go to a lot of places to get it. This is one of the most diverse areas of Washington, D.C., of the city, and I love the diversity. Diversity is what really keeps me going and keeps our family going because we believe in inclusiveness and including everybody in the process, and this area, Urban Neighborhood Association, is inclusive of everyone, regardless of your height, size, anything. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, or we're just generally going to go uh, from right to left uh, in our order, so uh, Councilmember Orange will be next to give his thoughts for 30 seconds. Well, I definitely love the District of Columbia, and I like the small neighborhoods. Uh, I've been living in the Brooklyn, Michigan Park neighborhood for probably like the last 20, 25 years. I like the fact that I can walk down the street and get my shoes shined. I can go to Howard's Hardware Store. Uh, I get my hair cut there, I get uh, go to the pharmacy, it's just a great neighborhood. And then I also like the fact that we were able to bring Home Depot and Giant to the area and we are building a livable, walkable community at that particular shopping center. Thank you. Mr. Shapiro. Thank you. What I, I, what I like most about this area is the diversity, and it's, it's diversity in all sorts of ways. So it's a, the, it's a diversity of folks around race and culture. Uh, around class, uh, it's a diversity of housing stock, it's a diversity of uh, retail, uh, diversity of transportation options. Uh, it's a very high functioning area. Uh, and this is what I'd like to see more of in neighborhoods throughout the city. We are a city of neighborhoods and one by one we need to make them as livable as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question uh, is actually going to be for Councilmember Orange, and uh, relates to something that you just said a moment ago. One of the criticisms some people levy against you, perhaps, is that you're a council member for big box stores, that when you talk about economic development, you primarily talk about bringing Home Depot. 
Many perceive stores like this one as driving out the small businesses in our neighborhood commercial areas. We know you certainly have stated that you recognize how important our locally owned small businesses are and how they add character to the neighborhood. Therefore, I wanted to ask if you could give us an example of a time when you specifically and personally took action to help a local small business, not through a DSLBD or other executive branch managed program, but acted personally in your role as council member and neighborhood leader. Absolutely. Uh, when I became chairman of the Committee on Government Operations in 2002, uh, I noticed that only one agency in the District of Columbia was in compliance with the law that states that 50% of your expendable budget must be spent with local small disadvantaged businesses. So I called in every agency head and asked them why they were out of compliance and if they came back the following year out of compliance that I would move to try to reduce their budgets. To make a long story short, I took the spending with the LSDB community from $98 million to $567 million. When I returned to the council last year, I noticed that there had not been any hearings and that the spending had decreased. So once again, I held a hearing, exposed that the local small businesses in the District of Columbia had been shortchanged for the fiscal year 2011 to the tune of $400 million, and for fiscal year 2010 to the tune of uh, $180 million. So I believe that the dollar must circulate in our small, small business community pursuant to the law, and I've been uh, the champion of that. Mr. Shapiro, for 30 seconds. Thank you. For 30 seconds, uh, uh, for those of you who know, I grew up in Washington, D.C. I've been here about half my life. And for a period of time, I was in Prince George's County. And while there, I became a member of the Prince George's County Council. And I led the effort to revitalize a section of the Route 1 corridor, which is now an arts district. That arts district is built on the strength of small businesses up and down that corridor. These are restaurants, these are art galleries, these are coffee shops. Very, very effective, and it was all on the strength of small businesses and my support for them. Dr. Holness? I'm getting, I don't know why I keep trying to pick up and give someone else the microphone, but at any rate, I believe in small businesses. That's dear and dear, near and dear to my heart. I'm a small business owner. I'm from a small business family. I think small businesses are what makes our neighborhoods viable. I think we need a business trust fund for our small businesses because our small businesses are, work, are going to keep us alive. Uh, there are not a, enough jobs, obviously, to go around. And as James Brown said, we don't want anybody to give us anything. But James Brown said, I don't want anybody to give me nothing. Open up the door, let us get it ourselves. Start our own business, create our own wealth, create our own jobs. And we've been joined by uh, former council member Sekou Biddle. And I'd like to ask if he wants to follow up on this topic for 30 seconds. The question um, is, uh, something that you have done personally to help a small business in a particular neighborhood such as your own. Yeah, so the way I've helped small businesses in my neighborhood is by patronizing them, obviously. Um, you know, we have some small business owners, and I would like to see us have more entrepreneurs in communities actually bring businesses to their local neighborhood. My mother worked for SBA for many years, so I've got an appreciation for the financing we need to do to provide for small businesses. But, you know, I was, as, as a, a nonprofit leader, with Jumpstart, I've had to deal with the actual challenges of navigating the tax and revenue as well as the regulatory framework of the district, which makes it very hard for small businesses to thrive in this environment. All right, thank you. Um, I, I would like to ask a follow-up on that one because I was really hoping that, that uh, some of our candidates could talk about specific examples and ways that they've not just used sort of large-scale government programs or changed the budget of the District of Columbia, you know, but actually, uh, you know, try to assist the small businesses more directly because I have heard often people say, I brought this particular business here, but sometimes it's, it's really a large one or, you know, something like that. We recently had one uh, Ward 5 uh, small restaurant close and they claimed that competition from a, a national chain was a factor. So I guess my follow-up uh, for Council Member Orange, you know, would be can you talk about any specific businesses, um, not programs, but individual businesses and what you've done for them? Well, uh, absolutely. Uh, on 12th Street, uh, there was uh, Kelly's Ellis Island, who I worked with and uh, knew his children. They, they have a, uh, also, I think, the Irish Pub over by Georgetown. Uh, also, you had uh, Tiki's Bar that was next to, to Colonel Brooks. And also, in terms of small businesses, I brought uh, public access television to Ward 5 and placed them in uh, Brooks Mansion, went to bat for them, uh, got a $750,000 grant to, to renovate the building. Uh, so I'm involved in all type of small businesses. Even you talk about Home Depot and Giant, 
There are 70,000 square feet of new retail going on that site, and I negotiated for 10% of that to be set aside for community folk. So for someone that wanted to have a coffee shop, me, I would want to just sell the Danish and coffee every morning. I, I just, a little small shop. So I'm, those are the type of things I've been involved in. Thank you very much. Um, my next question is for Council Member Biddle. Council Member, uh, former Council Member Biddle. Uh, <laughs> sufficient. Mr. Biddle. I'm just going to say Mr. Biddle. Mr. Biddle, DC uh, put the mayor and chancellor in charge of DC's public schools several years ago. There have been some mixed results, and some people would like to see greater urgency. But many people believe our system is now on the right trajectory. Yet we've seen the DC Council repeatedly inject itself into the process and make decisions that would often be the purview of the chancellor, such as demanding middle schools or other specific schools in certain wards. And the council just voted to set some new requirements for graduation that were very specific. Do you think the council should be making these types of decisions, or is it more proper to leave these up to the chancellor? Well, as so many of you know, I've spent four years on the Board of Education. It, it's, it's, much, I mean, it's much more appropriate to leave these decisions to the chancellor. I think the role of the council, as, as the role of the board was in the past, is to ascertain from the chancellor and from the mayor, what are the barriers, what are the policy problems that the council can remove or change? So when I was on the board, one of the challenges we had was DCPS could not recruit enough good teachers because the restrictions around licensure requirements made it such that the talent pipeline available to them was much smaller than they needed to get good quality teachers in the classroom. And so we were charged with changing the licensure requirements and allowing new programs to certify teachers so that we could increase the number of people who are available to go into the workforce. And that's really the role the council can play here around setting and maintaining policy as then, as well as then providing the oversight to make sure that the, the things that the chancellor and the mayor say they're going to do are actually getting done with the resources that we have. Uh, Councilmember Orange. Well, first of all, I believe it, it's a partnership, and I can give you a classic example. One morning I was watching Fox Morning News and I saw our children in the month of May complaining about not having books for their core subjects, and school was out the next day. I went and talked to, the, uh, at that time, the superintendent, and she was sounding like oblivious to it. So I introduced legislation that demanded that our children get books for their core subjects by the second week of school. It took two years to get that passed. The Washington Post wrote editorials against me. The school system was against me. And one year later, they apologized to me, and the bill passed. So it's a partnership. Mr. Shapiro. I think the council does not take its oversight role very effectively. Uh, right now, education issues are uh, overseen by the Committee of the Whole. What it means is that education issues are a bit of a political football. Every council member takes a little kick every now and then. Uh, there's no coherence around how the council is overseeing education. Uh, I think there should be an education committee. It would allow for a few council members to drill down to take up their oversight role in a much more effective, thoughtful, meaningful way. Because most policy... Well, I Dr. think Hollis. it's... I think it's a, a proper decision to allow the chancellor to participate in the process. I don't think that the entire decision of what happens with our school system should be left up to the chancellor. I think we need to involve parents. I think we need to involve community members. I think we need to involve the young people. I also think we need to involve educators. I'm a former educator at the University of District of Columbia, participated in the development of the community college, which is the feeder school for our DCPS students. And I think in order for us to prepare a future, we need to educate all of our people. Thank you. My next question is uh, for Mr. Shapiro. Uh, most of uh, the residents of DC are proud of being Washingtonians, living here rather than elsewhere. And there are many ways that we are greater than other places, but this pride can also cut both ways when there's something we could learn from our neighbors. You were a leader in Prince George's County, which faces a lot of issues such as affordable housing uh, that we face. Um, can you name some ways that you provided leadership on affordable housing uh, in Prince George's that you would like to bring to DC? Uh, sure. Prince George's County had uh, a strong resistance to additional affordable housing. Uh, this was a, essentially an informal county policy. Uh, the line in Prince George's was we, uh, we are the affordable housing policy for our neighbor, Montgomery County. Uh, so, but that wasn't healthy because there's a real need for affordable housing. And so I led the effort to create, to, to build uh, the first affordable housing, affordable housing in years in the, in the county. And I did it by connecting it to the Arts District. So we created uh, three buildings of affordable housing that were live workspace for artists uh, that helped change the county policy. 
and I'm, I'm just as committed to affordable housing and expanding the stock of affordable housing in, in, in the same creative ways and in very traditional ways for the city. Dr. Hollis? Well, I don't live in Prince George's County, so I didn't create, in, create any affordable housing in Prince George's County. I was not one of those DC residents who's moved to what is deemed affordable housing in Prince George's County, but I've participated. I believe that affordable housing is what we need in the District of Columbia. I live in Ward 1, as I've said, and the cost of living and the uh, housing is astronomical. I think there needs to be put something in place, legislation or otherwise, that we might be able to create eight affordable housing, not just for those who are low income, um, but for all of DC residents. Mr. Biddle. Thank you. I think you know, the one of the challenges around affordable housing is I grew up in the neighborhood not too far from here at the 13th and Irving Street, and my parents bought their home there in the early 70s because that's where they could afford to buy a house in the district. Now, many, many, many years later, most of the people that I grew up with can't afford to live in that community anymore now that they finally have the amenities that people so desperately needed during those, those years. So we've got to make sure that we provide housing that's affordable, but also the neighborhood amenities that will make it a place that you can actually live in, because many of the places you can afford the cost of housing, thank you, you can't actually live in. Ms. Charge. Yes, I, I support the Housing Production Trust Fund, and I believe that this government has to get back to making the annual contribution of approximately $18 million. You use that, you can leverage about $200 million in building affordable housing. Under the plan, the Economic Resurgence of Washington, D.C., Citizens Plan for Prosperity, we were supposed to build 55,000 housing units, of which 19,000 would be apartments. In 2006, we had the $1.6 billion to get it done, but the Fenty administration turned away from the plan and went, went in another direction. We need to get back to that plan. I actually wanted to ask uh, for sort of a brief show of hands. We're going to do a few of these throughout the discussion. Uh, Mr. Orange mentioned the Housing Production Trust Fund, and in the last budget, that was uh, significantly cut. Um, if, if you were or are on the council, would you support in this budget uh, restoring, uh, re-increasing the size of the Housing Production Trust Fund, uh, cutting it further, or something else? Uh, who would, uh, would want to uh, restore it to a, a previous level? Um, all right, to the level that it was in the previous, but uh, that was supposed to be before the cuts the last time. And to increase it. All right. Um, I had a, a, one more follow-up uh, as well uh, for Mr. Orange. Um, in the last budget debate, again, uh, you supported an amendment to the budget by Councilmember Tommy Wells to restore some funding for affordable housing, homeless services, and a few other elements. Um, and uh, there was some discussion on the dais, a sort of a horse trading, where you asked for support for $500,000 for Emancipation Day celebration at the Lincoln Theater. Um, could you explain sort of why that was uh, what you thought, uh, why, why you saw that as the most pressing budget priority uh, at that time? I saw the Housing Production Trust Fund, disability, and the homeless issues as very important. I think we were talking about maybe 18 or 20 million dollars, and of that, I wanted to get $500,000 to celebrate this year as the 150th anniversary of President Abraham Lincoln signing the document in, uh, on April 16, 1862, that freed the slaves in the District of Columbia. And this is the 150th year anniversary. It's part of the Civil War history. It's part of the bicentennial celebration of, of, of Lincoln. And I don't think that uh, we should belittle that history, and we should embrace it. And this is the time to do it. Uh, thank you. For um, the next question, I'd like to talk about um, uh, about same-sex marriage for a moment. D.C. allows same-sex marriage, but the issue is not settled in Maryland, where a likely ballot initiative this fall will have voters deciding whether to keep or repeal the new law legalizing same-sex marriage. Some Maryland residents are uh, probably watching right now, either here or in the live streaming video, and others will watch the archive later. I would like to ask if you could uh, look at the camera up there on the bar and tell the people of Maryland how you would advise them to vote on this ballot question and why. This question's for everyone, so we'll do 30 seconds for every person. And uh, we'll start with um, Mr. Shapiro. Thank you. I would uh, encourage all Maryland residents to support marriage equality uh, when it comes to the ballot, because it is likely to come to the ballot. This is a fundamental civil right, and it's a right that we should uh, wholeheartedly support, and I would encourage all Marylanders to do it. I'm very, very proud that we have marriage equality in the District of Columbia, 
and I'm proud of the Maryland legislature for what they did, and hopefully the uh, resident citizens of uh, Maryland will continue to support it. Dr. Hollis. As you know, I'm a theologian, and we are inclusive people. We believe that all God's children are equal. I believe that the residents of uh, Maryland should decide what they feel. I think the people should make their own decision and not those of us who are on the outside. I don't think legislators should dictate because, number one, human rights cannot be legislated. And so I think it is up to the people uh, what they decide to do with same-sex marriage. Mr. Biddle. So I think absolutely the residents of Maryland should be voting to support same-sex marriage and marriage equality. It's, they should be proud of the fact that they've got the leadership in the state today that has been willing to go to this issue after failing once to bring it back to make sure they can establish marriage equality. The, the fact of the matter is we've got a sad history in this country of oppressing all different kinds of people for all sorts of phony reasons. And history is borne out over and over again. When you, when you concoct these reasons to keep people down, the history always proves that we're wrong, so let's continue to fight for what's right for all residents so that we can all enjoy marriage equality throughout the country. Mr. Orange. Yes, I would uh, urge the, the residents and the voters of uh, the state of Maryland to support marriage equality. Uh, I think uh, Governor O'Malley and the legislator have, have taken the step to, to put the, uh, the referendum uh, on, uh, up for a vote. And uh, we in the District of Columbia, uh, we have marriage equality. When I was the, Democratic, the National Democratic State Committee man in 2008, I supported the resolution for marriage equality, having uh, changed uh, you know, my views on that as, as well. And I think uh, it's time has come. Thank you. We're going to have another little brief show of hands uh, period here, another little lightning round. Uh, this one's going to be about transportation. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, how many of you are Capital Bike Share members? I'm a biker. I own my own bike. All right. <laughs> I, many people own bikes and are Capital Bike Share yeah. members. Mr. Vidal has his key. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, how many of you are members of Zipcar? I have my own car. <laughs> I own my own car. All right. And have any of you signed up for uh, yet for the new uh, car to go one way car sharing program that's coming soon? No, because no, I yet. ride my bike and drive my own car. Uh, in just a, a few words, you know, two, three or four words, uh, when was the last time you personally rode Metro? You start with uh, Mr. Biddle. Uh, so, what day is today? <laughs> Tuesday. Um, I would, it's sometime in the last two to three weeks. I can't remember the exact day. Okay. Mr. Orange? Just here recently, uh, my wife and my daughter and I, we went to see Safe House. Mr. Shapiro? Yeah, I don't know exactly. It was last week, but I don't remember what day. Dr. Holness? I'm on the subway all the time, so it's yesterday, day before yesterday. I'm always there. I have a card. I ride. Um... <laughs> and I don't have a smart card. I'm not that smart. I just get a ticket. Could you name a, a bus route that you think is successful at connecting neighborhoods in the District of Columbia and helping people get around, and why? Uh, I'll start with Mr. Orange. Well, I would have to say the, the, the bus route that comes from uh, southeast and comes uh, into town down 8th Street. Uh, you see a, a lot of the uh, administrative workers are, are, are you know, use Metro to come into the city. It's a huge, huge uh, bus line, and it's always packed. And I think that's uh, one of the beauties of the A Street and the Gallery Place is just the fact that it all comes together. Metro, uh, you have the, the Metro, you have the buses, you have the Circulator, and you have the Zip cars as well as the... Uh, Can you, by the way, tell me what, uh, what number that is? Oh. All right. Well, I'm going to have to, I think I'm going to have to dock you for another <laughs> question because one of your volunteers is answering the questions for you. It was Mr. a phone Sh a friend. I Mr. Think. Shapiro. Yeah, I and, and, and I just want this in a, a few words. I think we're not doing 30 seconds, so if we could. Well, the, the route that I first think of is the route that I took when I was uh, growing up going to school. Uh, I went to school um, uh, on Macomb Street, and I lived in uh, Upper Northwest, and I took the L246 or 8 uh, down Connecticut Avenue, and it was a great experience for me. I was a young boy, uh, and I liked taking Metro. I liked, it, uh, I liked getting the little tokens, uh, and it, it was kind of an adult experience for me as a boy to, to take the bus. And so for me, it was kind of an integrating experience. It helped me connect with all sorts of folks in the city. 
Dr. Holness? I would say the 70 and the 92 because they go all over the place and they take you where you need to go. You get there fast and they're, while they may have a lot of people on them at different times, but it, it's a route that takes you all over the city. So that's, those are the two that I would say. Mr. Biddle? Yeah, certainly. I started as a very young child taking the 96 bus across town from Adams Morgan to Cleveland Park. And it's obviously one that goes into far southeast. And I'd say I had many of my students when I taught, they would take the 96 from Anacostia into um, the Navy Yard. H2 and H4, I spent the better part of 10 years commuting to and from school on every day. And my son now takes it once or twice a week to go to his grandparents' house. Then the, the S2, S4, S9. S9 is my favorite because it's the express bus it picks up a block away from my house and takes me door to door downtown to work. So that's been a godsend for me. Um, thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, is actually for Mr. Orange, so we're not going to skip his turn on this next question because then it wouldn't really allow me to ask him the question. Um, my question is, as we've grown our bicycle infrastructure in DC, we're able to help many people get around by bicycle. This also cr creates a natural tension with the many people who travel by car. Many lanes are different from what people are used to seeing, and the poles marking off the lanes can be confusing at first. There's an education process on both sides for drivers and cyclists. On New Year's Day, your Cadillac was spotted in the 15th Street bicycle lane. <laughs> cyclists are sensitive to this because parked cars in the lane force many to ride in incoming traffic. You immediately apologized for it, which we appreciate, and I'm certain learned cyclist frustration. So my question is, what do you think are ways that cities need to be finding that balance? educating drivers about what cyclists are looking for as we build all modes of transportation and educating cyclists about what drivers need so all modes are respected on city streets. Well, I'm glad you, uh, you raised that issue. Uh, I was attending a Metropolitan AME Church that day and I parked on the wrong side of the, of the cone. I was figured out later I was supposed to park on the other side so it wasn't my intent. But when I got there, the other cars were also parked on, on, on that side. And um, so, you know, I parked on the wrong side. I immediately apologized, and I looked at it, and I said, you're supposed to park on the other to the left, not to the right of the white, uh, you know, cones. And yes, I do think education is key, because if I had been educated, I would have known that you parked to the left <laughs> and not to the right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Shavira. Yeah, education is key. And, and there's, you know, there's going to be an, an ongoing tension. And, we, and it's really educating both drivers and bike riders uh, about uh, appropriate uh, uh, safety measures as we interact more and more. But you know, bike, bicycle rush really is going to be a, a huge part of our city's, a, a mode that's a huge part of our city's transportation system. Uh, and we need to be much more attentive to it. I actually would encourage, like along 15th Street, finding ways to provide more right-of-way access for bicycle riders. Thank you, Dr. Hollis. Thank you. I'm a biker, so I don't um, block bike lanes. I'm very sensitive to bikers because I am one. And with gas going up 51 cents, as it has recently, I believe that we're going to have more bikers in the District of Columbia because of the affordability of gas. But I think we do need an education for both bikers and non-bikers so that we will be sensitive to all of our concerns so that non-bikers will know not to park in bikers uh, um, spots where bikers drive. And as a uh, former chair of 1B, we were instrumental on 15th Street. Thank you, Mr. Biddle. Yeah, so education is hugely important. I mean, the infrastructure will catalyze more people to ride their bikes. I started riding mine downtown because there's a protected bike lane continuously from Walter Reed all the way into downtown DC, and that encouraged me and, point, and lots of other people to ride. I think we need to make sure, you know, at every sort of point of entry, so anyone getting a driver's license in the district needs to be, in, you know, in the test, learning the rules of the road for what's available for, bi for cyclists so that they're aware and not hitting cyclists. But then those of us as bikers have to also be attentive to following the rules of the road because we're endangering lots of other people as well. Thank you. My next, my next question is for Mr. Shapiro. Um, and I believe that there were people outside uh, petitioning for the ballot initiative to um, ban corporate contributions uh, to council campaigns and other campaigns in the District of Columbia. Um, do you support that? And do you think that there are any other campaign finance reforms that are necessary to make sure our elections are fair? 
Uh, yes, I support the ban on corporate contributions. I think it's a very necessary step. I wish the council would take action on this because though I, I appreciate the organizing effort that's going to go into it and I'm going to do my part and hope it is very successful, it would be uh, an easy thing for the council to do if we just had a council that was in the right place on this issue. But I believe banning corporate contributions is just the first step. We need all sorts of more transparency when it comes to contributions to campaigns. And ultimately, if, if I had the magic wand and if I could help organize this council, I believe we need public financing of campaigns. Because money does, as we have seen from the newspapers as of late, money has a corrupting influence on politics. And the more we can take the money out of it, the more healthier system we'll have. Dr. Hollis. I'm really glad you asked that question because I'm unbought and unbossed and will speak truth to power. I am the only one of the four candidates who has not received any corporate contributions. I believe we do need campaign reform because I believe when you accept funds from corporations, it is a pay to play. All of the candidates here have received corporate contributions. As I said, I'm number two on the ballot, which is second to none. You need to vote for me because I'm the one who doesn't have to sign a document to say that I will be ethical and that I will not take funds. Mr. Vettel. I have to go after that. Um, so yeah, I mean, campaign finance reform is a hugely important issue. I think the events of late sort of raised the flag that um, we need to look at how we ban or regulate money order contributions to campaigns, which have clearly been a, an issue of late. How we look at you know, disclosure around contractors who are giving to campaigns because clearly look, people are looking for and are getting influence and it is in insidious and it's really damaging our contracting process. I think we need to look at how we get the council out of contract approval. And you know, I was at the launch for the, for the campaign for public trust because I believe this is the right direction for us to move in. Mr. Orange. I wrote uh, legislation to ban outside employment of council members and I uh, also uh, did an editorial for the Washington Post on the subject matter. I believe the two go hand in hand. I do not, be I believe that you need to ban corporate contributions and ban council members for working for those, those corporations. What good is it that if, if you're gonna have a council member that can work for the corporation, but then you say the corporation can't contribute to the others. We have council members that make as much as $300,000 through outside employment and their employer has business with the city and that doesn't uh, work. Uh, thank you. I'd like to ask a follow-up um, because you have said that I would like to ask everyone to hold the applause. Um, I know there are a number of supporters of a number of candidates, but we don't want this to be a popularity contest based on who got their con uh, supporters uh, here, especially given that uh, some people uh, live farther away or whatever. Anyway, um, the, my question, my follow-up question Sorry, is uh, that, um, you know, you, you talked about banning um, uh, you know, uh, part-time employment for council members, but have, um, I believe, not co-sponsored uh, uh, the, the companion le uh, similar legislation introduced by Tommy well uh, Mary Che and Tommy Wells uh, to ban corporate contributions. Do you think that um, that that is actually an undesirable thing to do? Uh, or, I mean, you, you've said that it's just not enough, we need to do these other things, but do you actually think we should not deal with the corporate contribution issue? I, I think that the legislation that, been, that has been introduced was self-serving by council member Che, who has two other jobs. She makes $240,000 from GW. She makes additional $50,000 as a bar review professor. And to say that you want to ban, uh, ban corporate contributions when basically she works for one of the biggest employers in the District of Columbia. So there's divided loyalties there. And so, you know, she can take the money that she makes from those organizations, save 10% of it on an annual basis, and she can run her campaign, while at the same time, she'll say no one else can take a corporate contribution. So that's how I view it, and I think if they want to put them both right. together, then I would vote for it. Uh, thank you. Um, next question is for Dr. Holness. Uh, in a recent debate, uh, you said you support a proposal to give about half of the land in the Hill East Reservation 13 parcel for practice fields for the Redskins. I believe, I believe because you said that uh, the land must be used for recreation under the master plan. But the master plan calls for a mixed-use neighborhood, and it was formulated by the community calling for some recreation space. Do you think it is appropriate to fulfill a neighborhood desire for recreation space by setting it aside for a billionaire to close to the public? I didn't get that last statement that you made. Just, just say no. <laughs> I mean, uh, this, this proposal would not create recreation space for, uh, for the community 
there, it would not be playing fields for the children of the, of the housing in the area to, uh, to be able to play soccer, but rather, uh, or whatever they want to play, but rather would be for the, the highly paid professional football players. Do you think that that's the appropriate way to fulfill the master plan? No, I don't, because I, I, I think that there needs to be more recreational facilities for our young people, particularly rec resources for children after school. Uh, we still have a lot of uh, latched key kids in Washington, D.C. They're learning how to read, write, arithmetic, and everything in school, but when they get out of school, the, their creative juices are still flowing. There are things that they need to do, and I believe that if we create more facilities, not only for our young people, but for our seniors as well, we need uh, areas for our seniors to go so that they might have recreational uh, facilities. I was over at the Deanwood community today, which is a mixed source uh, community center uh, there. They have a program for seniors. They have a program for young people in the building. They have a program for just about anybody in the neighborhood that you can think of. We need more swimming pools in our areas. We need more recreation soccer fields. My husband plays soccer with Bob Marley. We definitely need more soccer in the area. Uh, we have a great team, and I think we need to utilize those resources as best as we can so that all of the district residents might be able to benefit from it. So I'll just jump ahead with the follow-up that logic comes to my mind is, those things sound great in all of those neighborhoods. Why not for the Reservation 13 neighborhood instead of a Redskins practice facility? Why not? I agree that it should be for that. But when you look at, uh, when I was looking at the information regarding the Redskins Stadium and what the purposes for which the land was used for, if that is the source that the uh, purpose for which the land is used for, I would agree that the land should be used more for the residents than the Redskins. Thank you. Mr. Biddle. Yeah, so, um, which question am I answering now? Um, Talk about your, uh, your, your thoughts about the Reservation 13 yeah. uh, deal that's being proposed. Yeah, so I think I've, I've spoken clearly this, that, you know, I love the Redskins. I grew up in the district. I've watched them for years. They have, unfortunately, let us down for many years. <laughs> but, you know, that being said, I would love to see them be a better team. I don't know that us spending our money and, and the opportunity cost of giving away land to the Redskins is going to help them be better or help us be a better city where I think that land can do much more to create a vibrant neighborhood in and around that community. And this is probably the best chance we have to spur development in that community. So I think we would far better serve to use the, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. No, I would not invest $50 million to provide a practice facility for no team. Uh, I, I think that what we need to be doing is seeing if we can bring the Redskins back to DC and, and examine that and examine uh, maybe, um, uh, building a dome in place of RFK Stadium, but there has been a lot of work by citizens that have come up with a plan, and I think that we need to execute the plan that they agreed upon. But fifty million dollars for a practice facility that doesn't generate anything, but a, you know, a, more for Dan Snyder, I don't support that. Mr. Shapiro. Yeah, I agree with that. It's th this has been a you know what's happening. Uh, the plans at Reservation Thirteen Hill East have been in the books, have been in the works for ten years. And to come along at the last minute with something that uh, that uh, undermines uh, the will of the community and actually does not, it's a it's not just a missed opportunity cost it's it's potentially millions and millions of dollars of lost revenue uh, because the development that's going to go in is really good for the city uh, so this is a bad plan and and it's very frustrating I think when local governments get starry-eyed uh, about football teams in that way. Um. So uh, follow up, one more follow-up for Mr. Orange. If there were uh, 50 million or, or more or less proposal to subsidize um, a new stadium uh, rather than a practice facility, would, do you then think that public money should be devoted to, uh, to this particular sports team? I, I think that I could come up with, with a plan that builds the, the dome out at RFK Stadium and incorporate it with the mixed use development project and make it a very vibrant neighborhood that generates revenue for the city. Uh, you know, people were against the baseball stadium and now we see that the baseball stadium not only pays for itself, it provides a tremendous, tremendous amount of revenue. The part that, that is upsetting about the baseball stadium is that they took our $450 million community benefit fund and put it someplace else. But the citizens were entitled to $450 million from the community benefit fund that has been realized but not received by us, the citizens. Thank you. Question uh, is for uh, uh, Mr. Biddle. DC Council Chairman Kwame Brown has promised to repay taxpayers for the cost of two Lincoln Navigators leased by DC for his personal use, uh, apparently in violation of the law. 
which ended up costing the district at least $20,000. However, we're more than a year removed and he has not paid the money back thus far. You owe some or amount of your quick rise to the support you had from the chairman. What have you done or what would you do to encourage or persuade the chairman to make good on this promise? Yeah, so for those of you who may remember, you know, last year when the Navigator Gate became the, the you know, cause celeb in the district, I, I very clearly you know, spoke out and said that the chairman need to pay for the entire amount the district was on the hook for these navigators. And to be clear, you know, he was parsing and trying to explain that he was going to pick up the cost for the time in which he used the vehicles. And I called for him to pay the cost that the city ended up paying for the entirety of the lease of the vehicles because, you know, whatever set of crazy circumstances that got us to the place where we were leasing two navigators for the chairman, we, we residents are not responsible. And this only works in one or two directions. Either we pick up the tab or he does. He's the one who led to this series of mistakes that put us on the hook for it. And I feel like he's ultimately responsible and needs to pay for it. Mr. Orange. You know, I just cannot resist. I want to say this. You see what happened to Tommy Wells fooling around with that issue. The thing is that Tommy Wells has a great plan for livable, walkable communities, and he had a, a committee where he could implement that vision. And unfortunately, he got removed because he dealt, you know, with that it, with that issue. It's an issue that, you know, at the end of the day, Kwame Brown should fulfill his obligation as stated. And if not, the voters will have an opportunity to take that issue up at the ballot box. Um. I have a follow-up, but, but let's see, let, let Mr. Sh uh, Mr. Shapiro talk. For yeah, I just, wanna, I, I just wanna make sure I heard what I heard from Mr. Orange, which was that the reason why you were not speaking up on this issue is because Kwame Brown may take a committee assignment away from you? <laughs> sure. No, what I'm saying is that Tommy Wells had a, has a great vision for a livable, walkable community. And he, he made his case, and then he kept going on and on and on. Sometimes you have to look at the limits of, of your authority. It isn't something that you go out and make news on the chairman and beat the chairman down. He did his job, and he should have left it alone. He did his job. But when you just keep pressing and pressing and pressing, then all of a sudden, you know, this is, this is what occurred. And no other council members came to his defense. And we lost the livable, workable community vision that he had. I mean, I guess, why didn't you come to his defense? First of all, I, I just got back on the council, and, and um, you know, it was an issue that that council was actually de dealing with. I did not have all the facts other than what I read in the paper, but this was something that was between Council Member Wells and Council uh, Member Kwame Brown. They had been back and forth discussing this and discussing it, and I don't know what was the intimate details of it. I mean, right. they even went to personnel issues. I don't know what was going on. All right, I wanna, we, we didn't actually give Mr. Shapiro all of his time, so if you wanna, do you wanna? Yeah. You know, I just, off? it's complicated for me, and I think part of the problem here is this is where this, this is the way in which the city council can be so dysfunctional, because this is about political machines and this is about infighting, and it's not about effective leadership for the city. So I, I disagree with you, Mr. Orange. I believe that there are times when you just, I think what Tommy Wells did was the appropriate thing to do. He just stood up and said what he needed to do. And we don't need to trade political machines here. Kwame Brown has a political machine. It's actually a machine, Mr. Biddle, that is one of the reasons why you're here as well. Dr. Holness. Well, for one, I don't think that council members should be afforded vehicles to drive. Uh, there are uh, vehicles that are owned already by the district, and if they need a driver, then that's a whole different ballgame. But I think uh, Mr. Brown needs to pay back all of the monies that were afforded him, that he used for the vehicles. And I did get the, I did hear that it, Mr. Wells was punished for bringing the issue up from Mr. Orange. And I think that that is a travesty of justice that you would not be able to speak out for threat of your position in a, in a, on the council. Um, well, actually, that's, that's not what I said, but. All right. Um, I'm very interested by this topic, so I uh, actually want to see if Mr. Biddle wanted to add anything on the question of the, uh, the, the council committee shuffle. Add anything to it? Uh, well, you did, that came after you yeah. got a chance to, you know, follow yeah. up. Say something on the matter. Sure, say something on the matter. You know, I, I think that what's challenging about it to me is that the rationale for the committee shuffle really sort of didn't make a lot of sense to most people. 
know, the notion that we were somehow reorganizing the council and it was going to become more efficient. And I think, you know, what's happened since then sort of bears that out. Like, many people talk about the importance of education, and, and many people have espoused a belief, as I do, that we should have an education committee on the council. And yet, in this one opportunity to change the structure of the council, no one spoke up on that issue, but they all universally agreed that we were going to reshuffle Tommy out of his committee. Um, okay, next question is, uh, obviously each of you would choose yourself as the most effective member of a current or future council, but who do you think is, who sits on the council today, a close second to yourself? <laughs> and, uh, and why? Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Minister Shapiro. That's an interesting question. You know, if, if you want to say, it depends on how you define effective. So if it was about who's, I believe, whose policies uh, probably most in line with, I would say Mr. Biddle. If I had to say who's more effective at actually getting things done on the council, but they're not things that I always want to see get done, then I would say Mr. Orange. All right. Um. I may, just to be yeah, I sure that I the phrased the question the way I that I meant to phrase that. it, uh, yeah. I, was, um, I was specifically asking about sitting members of the council as opposed to the, the other here. people sitting here today. Speaking. Then I apologize for my answer. I, <laughs> I, I am sure I phrased the question slightly confusingly. My so head was in a different place. You can I'm think sorry. for a moment, and maybe I'll let you go for like 10 seconds at the very end. Uh, Dr. Holmes. Well, actually, I don't think that there's anyone on the council right now that I would deem would be second or close to what I'm thinking because I'm an independent thinker. I'm one of the only ones who um, really believe in the district and believe that uh, we don't need to take corporate contributions. I'm the only one who believes that we need, well, actually, in 1988, I was the one that proposed uniforms for DC public schools. So I've been in this game for a long time, longer than most of the people who are even serving on the council right now. So I just, I, I'm, I'm a thinker out of the box person. All right, Mr. Biddle. Yeah, so I, I appreciate the entertainment value of this question everybody you know, gets excited <laughs> for. Yeah, I'm, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you up front, I'm going to pass on actually answering the question directly, and for this reason. Because I'm a former teacher, and you know, you told the first day of school, don't have favorites. Like, you may like somebody, but don't tell anyone that you like this one child over another. And you know, draw the analogy to the council and the level of dysfunction we've had these days. It would actually harm the function of the council to suggest that you like one member over another. And so I'm not going to get into that sort of gamesmanship because it might be fun entertaining, but it's not productive. Okay, Mr. Orange. Well, everyone knows that uh, you know, I'm a finance person, and so I'm closely uh, aligned with the financial policies other than the constituent services policy of my good friend uh, Jack Evans, and I'm also closely aligned with the thinking of uh, the council member for Ward 4, Muriel Bowser. Thank you. Do you want to do a 15 seconds? I, I think with a little more clarity about the question, <laughs> uh, I would say Muriel Bowser. I've, I like the way she was able to pull together some measure of uh, coherence around these ethics issues. It was not a strong enough ethics bill, but it was a step in the right direction. I think she showed some strong leadership on that. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we're almost uh, out of our time, and I want to make sure that uh, um, all of you get a chance to uh, give, your, give some, some closing thoughts if you have any. Um, so uh, please go ahead and uh, I think we, in our order was going to be um, the person who was third uh, speaking first for this. So that um, would be Mr. Orange actually. So if you want to go ahead and give a closing thought. Oh, well, once again, thank you very much for uh, providing the opportunity to be here to, to have this dialogue with you. Uh, I, I, like I said before, I'm Vincent Orange, council member at large. I also serve as a Democratic National Committee man. My issues are the four E's, ethics, education, employment, and economic development. I know in a lot of your minds, you're probably uh, interested in uh, this latest issue about the money orders. I think tomorrow, uh, Tim Craig and Mike DeBonis, they get it right and they lay out the entire uh, story on uh, what transpired. Uh, and I'm just uh, happy to be back on the council. I'm glad that the 
citizens had faith in me to come back. And like I said when I was running, that I would introduce ethics legislation. I introduced four of the ten pieces of ethics legislation. I've addressed educational issues. I've exposed that the local business community has been shortchanged to the tune of $400 million. And I've opened the city up to the uh, movie industry. I actually have gotten a, a, a um, contract executed and is shooting now at the Crime and Punishment Museum. And I'm looking for other ways to uh, grow the District of Columbia and its economy. Thank you, Mr. Biddle. Thanks. So I want to thank you all for coming out this evening. It was a great, hopefully informative, entertaining opportunity for all of us to learn something about the candidates. I think that what's important as we go forward is to think about what are the things that really bring us all together, that unite us in our vision for the city. Because there's so many things that we are often times reminded of how we're different. And I think the thing that's going to propel us forward is us looking at what we care about and how we work on those things together to make the district a better place than it is today. How do we work together to make sure we've got strong schools that provide for an excellent education for all of our young people, that support economic development so that we're growing a generation of young entrepreneurs and we're growing jobs here in the city, and then we're creating the types of communities that have all the amenities that we want, all want to have in our communities, and that the transportation system allows us to get from place to place safely. So whether you're a biker or a walker or you happen to be someone who's driving, the city is a place that is, that is convenient and affordable for all residents. So once again, my name is Sekou Biddle. I'm asking for your support on April 3rd because I believe that my commitment to public service and to the residents of District of Columbia is second to none. Thank you. Dr. Holmes. E. Gail Anderson holding the second on the ballot, which means that I'm really second to none. And that wholeness is the right choice, and that I want to be your voice for employment issues for D.C. residents. I want to be your voice for affordable housing in the District of Columbia. I want to be your voice for education reform in the District of Columbia. I want to be your voice for parking issues in the District of Columbia. I want to be your voice for better bike lanes. I want to be your voice for a more cohesive government. I am an inclusive person. I've lived in the most diverse area of Washington, D.C. for the past 35 years. I'm unbought, I'm unbossed, and I will speak truth to Power. I am the freshest voice. I'm the only female on this ticket. I'm the only one that had the skills and leadership for to do this job. I'm the only one that believes that we together we can make a difference in this community. And I will be the one that will come to you to ask you what you would have us to do in this district and not what I would want to. I am not a dictator, so I believe in making all of the residents in the District of Columbia a part of the process. And so I'll come to you. E. Gail Anderson Holness is the right choice. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Shapiro. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I would ask for your support, and I'd ask you for your support for a very specific reason. First of all, I have the leadership experience, and I have the integrity, and I have the track record to make myself an effective legislator for you. But also, this election that we're in the midst of has a history to it. And this election has been a battle between some rival political machines and political leaders. We are here in part because of the last special election, and we're here in part because uh, Ms. Kwame Brown uh, did what he could do to make sure that Mr. Orange didn't become the next council member. And in part, that was working a backroom deal to make sure that Mr. Biddle was appointed, appointed to that council. And that was a deal that was with Kwame Brown and Harry Thomas Jr. Mr. Orange then turned around and won the election. Uh, and uh, he won the election, and from my perspective, with some illegitimate claims because of the finances that we're faced with. So we're in the midst of a scandal, and first and foremost, we need a break from the past. So I have the experience, and I'd say, let's move past this. Thank you very much to all of the candidates uh, for coming today. I'd also like to thank the Black Cat again for, uh, for generously hosting this. <laughs> And finally, uh, there's a post-forum uh, post reception at Cafe St. X, which is just down the street to the right. If you go out the door, uh, there will be complimentary hors d'oeuvres and a cash bar. So I hope you'll join us there for the discussion uh, to talk with, uh, I think, a few candidates may be able to stay. And I'll, of course, uh, talk with each other. So thank you so much to everyone for being here. Thank you.